Okay, we'll uh, reconvene to public session and attendance. Everybody is here. And we also uh, have to read the public comments card pursuant to board policy number 2350. Public comment may be limited to three minutes per person or 30 minutes per topic. All speakers who would like to comment regarding a matter on the meeting agenda must submit a public comment card to the board president or recording secretary prior to the point in the meeting at which the agenda item is called. All speakers who would like to comment regarding a matter not on the meeting agenda must submit a public comment card to the board president or recording secretary prior to the point in the meeting for open forum on non-agenda items. Public comment cards are available at the information table at the rear of the boardroom from the recording secretary or online. We ask that all speakers come to the podium to address the board. Thank you. Okay, so let's go to uh, Pledge of Allegiance, Ms. Gaines. Right hand over your heart, ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we come to item 9.1, which is uh, agenda approval. And we are removing item 14.4 from the meeting agenda. And so if I could have a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Okay. All right, does everybody have their mics on? Okay. So any discussion? Hearing none advice. Approved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Okay, open forum on non-agenda items. And I believe we have two speaker cards. Uh, Melissa Chavez. Good evening. My name is Melissa Chavez. And before I get started, I really wanna thank the district for offering the grief counseling uh, that's coming up soon. I think that's great resource for my colleagues. Um, I'm a classified employee here at AVC. Last month, I addressed the board in regards to the minimal efforts that I have seen from the college to increase the wages of their employees as our economy suffers from increasing food, housing, and living expenses. Since then, I can't tell you the number of colleagues who reached out to me for speaking up and thanked me for speaking up on this issue and those that, that have shared stories of their own struggles during this time. It is unsettling to know that we work for a district that we love and respect, but in which employees feel they are not supported or valued. AVC has to do better with opportunities for raises and wage increases to keep up with our economy and to reward for a job well done. Lastly, I want to encourage my colleagues to attend these meetings to let your voice be heard too. It matters. The board doesn't know what they don't know unless we make them aware. Thank you for your time. Be kind, serve students, support employees. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Cindy Hendricks. Good evening, President Zellett and members of the board. I'm Cindy Hendricks, lead negotiator for the ABCFT. I'm here to provide a brief negotiate, negotiations update and some very exciting news. Uh, if you have not heard, Governor Newsom signed AB 190, which is a trailer bill that provides over two, $200 million in funding for adjunct health care, um, which will be more than enough for districts to enable all adjunct faculty to have the same coverage as full-time faculty with no additional cost to either the district or the faculty member. Um, in fact, the cost of the district will be less than they are paying now. At our last negotiation session, the Federation presented an MOU to enable our adjunct faculty to gain access to high quality health care as soon as possible. Uh, we know the executive council has talked about that and we know administration has some concerns regarding how the reimbursement will occur along with other procedural questions. 
I'm hopeful that the chancellor's office will soon have some answers. Uh, big hopeful. Uh, however, this is truly a win-win. District costs will be lower, lower as well as adjunct costs. And we have, through a fluke of timing of negotiations, we have the opportunity to be one of the first colleges in the state to provide this option to our adjunct faculty. We look forward to working together with the district to complete this MOU. Um, additionally, during our last session, there was some really great conversation regarding the catastrophic leave bank. I certainly learned a lot from Bridget's comments and suggestions. I'm hopeful that we will be able to continue to have fruitful conversations, which will result in a solid contract. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving along, item 11.1, .1, presentation of MGI. Thank you, President, Trustees Mark McDonald with um, MGI Advocacy. It's great to be down here again with you. Um, I visited you last year. I, today I got a tour of the campus. Um, a lot of exciting things going on. Um, it was great to, it's, it's great to be back in person again and on the campus seeing everything. I have a PowerPoint presentation I'm going to present. Um, oh, okay. Thank you. So real quick, oh, it's off. That's why it wasn't working. <laughs> okay, um, just wanted to go back a little bit and um, look at what some of the victories were in the budget that was recently enacted. And number one was a significant base increase to your base operations, 600 million an additional funding that's flexible. Um, there was a significant cost of living adjustment. As you know, um, inflation has been high. They did that in order to address high inflation. The 600 million was on top of the COLA. So it's 600 million plus that 493 million. There's funding for more students. Um, and then to help attract students, there was 150 million to help you go out and recruit new students so that you can access that, sick, that half percent growth. A lot of money for scheduled maintenance, um, which is going to be necessary as you get students back on campus to upgrade those facilities. Um, and then 100 million for data security and network upgrades. This is a categorical program specifically for technology. 75 million one time, 25 million, which will be ongoing. And I'll talk a little bit later about an ask this year to get some more ongoing money for that technology because it, it is much needed. And then the other thing was eligibility on, I, I know you have a potential student housing project and moving the, when you had applied for funding last year, you had been put on the ineligible list. But moving that ineligible list, um, giving them the ability to get extra points when you apply this year for construction grant was um, also part of the budget trailer bill. Um, changes to the student-centered funding formula. There's going to be a new funding floor at the end of the 24-25 uh, fiscal year. So we really have three years to make decisions on the funding formula. Starting in 25, 26 districts, you'll receive greater of what you would have received in 24, 25, or if you're on the funding formula, you, re, you would receive that. If you're not on the funding formula, you do not receive a COLA. So it's real important that over the next three years, um, well, two now, that, um, we're able to put in place a funding formula that works for everyone. Budget wins for students. These are student support services that we'll see through this budget. 200 million in the student success and completion grant. This is for students that go full time, they get additional financial aid. Um, more students can qualify now for the Promise program and go free, tuition free. All full-time students are tuition-free now, not just first-time students. Um, 
30 million for a higher up program. This is a program that um, where provides funding to students that were formerly incarcerated. So students that are formerly incarcerated coming back to college, it gives them stipends so that they don't have to work as much and can potentially take more courses. Um, Cal Grant equity framework was implemented in the budget. However, it wasn't funded. So we're gonna have to work over the next two years to fund it. There's a trigger in 24, 25 that will determine whether it gets funded or not. And that change really benefits community college students. That change gives our community college students more money in their pocket, more uh, money for access costs, books, tools, computers, things like that. And then there is a dual enrollment pro grant program I wanna bring up with you. I was talking to your president about your plans around dual enrollment. There was $600 million through the Department of Education that's gonna go, it'll go to the K-12 schools, but it will go to the partnership. So looking, it's really a good time to look to partner with your K-12 partners and expand dual enrollment because it'll go towards that program. Um, just a quick analysis of the budget. One of the things we had asked for was money for CalSTRS and CalPERS to reduce those contributions because those really um, push out your operational costs. It was ended up not being included. Um, the base increase was much more significant rather than the CalSTRS and CalPERS. There was no changes to the student-centered funding formula. You also received a uh, COVID-19 institutional block grant, but it was really narrowly targeted. Um, next year, as we work towards a block grant, we'll try to get more flexibility. And then, as you know, now the Community College Promise Program could be implemented in the fall. So those students that are full-time can come immediately and, and not have to pay tuition. I have a list of bills here that went through. These are the highest priority bills. Every year, the legislature introduces thousands of bills, and we narrow those down and work with your president and your staff on what are the most important bills. One of the big ones, and this will help with AB 1705, which is the legislation that um, requires students to be placed in transfer level English and math courses. This will allow for apportionment for supervised tutoring. So you can set up tutoring, a tutoring center for students to get through those college level courses, those transfer level courses, and you can collect funding for that. That was a bill that was really instituted by this district along with a couple other districts. Um, I'll go down, AB 1705, I already mentioned, was signed by the governor, was a big one. Um, and then AB 1919, it came up today in a meeting. This was a bill that would have allowed for tree, free transit passes for students. It ended up being vetoed because there was no money in the budget for it. It'll get reintroduced next year. This is something that we'll look to get funded next year. Another one is AB 2627. This is a bill that could help with your enrollment. It allows you to partner with your counties to get um, contact information. Um, for potential students that might be engaged and want to enroll in a community college. So students or potential students that are unemployed, um, former veterans that may not know about the services that you provide, you can get a phone number, um, an email address, and a um, physical address to send them information about enrolling at Antelope Valley College. So here's some of the issues that I think we'll see in 2023. Again, we're going to be talking about a base allocation increase. This is something that we believe should be done every year. I mentioned before technology, huge issue. Um, mental health and safety, getting some money on the campuses for mental health and addressing, addressing safety on the campuses. CalSTRS and CalPERS, if we can lower so right now you're paying about 20% of your payroll into CalPERS and CalSTRS. If, if we can lower that, then that's operational money that you can free up to utilize 
for what it's supposed to be used for, right? Educating students. Um, funding for financial aid assistance, and then some more investment in affordable housing, which I know this district is, is looking to move forward on. Um, some other ones, students with dependent children. There's going to be a push for student funding to support students with dependent children, ongoing and one time. Um, and then some more, I mentioned before, financial aid reform, um, trying to make sure that we're able to fund that Cal Grant change. And then again, deferred maintenance funding. So just to finish up, what does the politi political outlook for next year look like? We're very likely gonna have the same governor. All the polls are posting or are showing that that's not going to change. There's going to be a new statewide chancellor, as you all know. Originally, they said they were going to take a year to try to find someone. Now they've cut that back. They wanna do six months and try to find someone in six months. So um, we could have a new chancellor sooner than later. And then, I, as you've been hearing, I'm sure revenue projections are lower. They're looking um, like they're going to be lower this year than was included in the budget. Um, so just, you know, we, we had a very, very, very good budget this year, but, um, you know, bear in mind that you can kind of tell by how the stock market goes because California is very reliant on high income earners and they get a lot of their money off of um, the stock market. So there's a speaker battle in the assembly. Um, there's two people that wanna be speaker. A lot of it will depend on what happens in the elections. We're gonna have 23 empty assembly seats. Um, you may have a new assembly member. Assembly member Lackey is running versus assembly member Smith. Um, they're both um, assembly members now, but the way that the redistricting was done, they were drawn into each other's district. So only one of them is going to win. So you could, um, see Mr. Lackey come back or uh, Mr. Smith would, uh, could be the other one. There's going to be 10 new Senate seats out of 40. And then, uh, but what's going to happen all likely in the end is Democrats will continue to hold two thirds of um, both chambers and be able to pass. Um, it, it'll come, the, the moderates end up determining um, what gets passed. Assembly Higher Education Chair, Assembly Education Chair, and the Senate Education Chair are all retiring. So we are gonna get new committee chairs on, on the committees that the major bills that impact you will go through. The Higher Education Committee will lose three or four more members, and the Senate Committee is gonna lose the chair and one more member. So I know I went through a lot of information. It was, it was rather quick, um, but with that, happy to take any questions that you might have on anything. Mr. Beats? Yeah, hi. Hi. Um, you know, I keep hearing about 24, 25, and all the dire predictions that are for that. Can you explain that? Yeah. So. 24, 25 is when they, they would implement the funding floor for community college districts. So up until then, what you're gonna get is at least what you got in 2017, 18, plus a COLA. So you get an automatic COLA every year until that year. And then that year, you either have to be generating revenue through the funding formula, or you're just gonna stay flat and you won't get a COLA, which actually means you're losing money, right? Because your utilities, health benefits, all those ancillary costs continue to go up. Um, so that's, that's why that 24, 25 number is out there because that's when that flattening of the funding formula kicks in. Okay, who, uh, who determines how these funds are allocated? 
office who talks about all these different funds? How is that through the chancellor's office? The majority of them are through the chancellor's office. Sometimes they'll put in the budget trailer bill how to be allocated. Um, for example, um, the technology money said that they'll has the chancellor's office doing it. And the chancellor's office has put a minimum amount for all districts in there. And then they're going to, and this is something that we asked for, they're going to try to distribute the rest of the money based on need. So, you know, I would argue, and we were talking today that Antelope Valley probably has a greater need when it comes to technology and cybersecurity than say Cabrillo College and Silicon Valley area probably does. Um, other times they'll put the actual allocation methodology in the trailer bill language in the legislation. So like the um, scheduled maintenance money was put out by FTES, full-time equivalent student. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing hearing none, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me again. <clears throat> We're moving along to item 11.2, presentation of purchasing update. Good evening. My name is Angela Musial. I'm the director of purchasing and contracts for the district. I also oversee warehouse operations. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I've been an employee of the district for 21 years, and the last 10 of those years have actually been in our purchasing contracts department. Uh, but before I begin my presentation, I actually wanted to just share a short video on the purchasing process with you. Dad, can I buy a candy bar? Go ask your mother for a purchase order. Mom, Dan says I can't buy a candy bar unless you cut me a P.O. Now, Charlie, you know I can't give you a P.O. without a purchase requisition. What do you need this time? One candy bar, please. Sign here, initial there. So when do I get my candy bar? As soon as the paperwork clears. End of next week. Maybe. Now, this time, make sure you approve the invoice before your mother pays it. This stinks. No kidding. show a true process of the purchasing department and the little boy is not wrong it is a very tedious process but for good reason we're spending taxpayer dollars we want to make sure we're being good stewards and we're spending funds appropriately so tonight i'm going to go over our district's procurement requirements and how we show that we're being good stewards so this first slide is showing our requirements based on dollar amounts so if we had, to, for an example, a $30,000 furniture purchase, we'd be looking at the orange bubbles. That purchase would typically require three quotes, and then it would require approval from both purchasing, accounting, and then those department approvers, which would be their director, dean, executive director, VP. And then it would also require approval from the executive director, <laughs> get my words out, of financial and fiscal services, as well as the president and our board of trustees. And there's also exceptions to purchasing uh, quotes and bids. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but I did want to just touch on one that all of you are probably very familiar with, which is our piggyback agreements. 
Um, these are agreements that have been formally bid on our behalf or the behalf of other entities. Sometimes they're also negotiated by our state or the chancellor's department and we're able to utilize those. Um, but they do not only provide a cost savings for the district, but also a uh, time saving. And just as an example, um, in July of this year, you had approved a piggyback agreement for UPS through Sourcewell. And prior to that agreement, we were spending $40 for a next day air letter. letter. And now that same letter is only costing us $15. So over a 60% savings. So I just want to take a moment and thank you for your continued support of those agreements. And then we also have requirements based on the type of purchase we were making. So if we were to take that same $30,000 furniture purchase, it would also require approval from our facilities department. They're looking at things such as like district standards or spacing requirements. And then if that also included installation, we'd also be looking at requirements such as like an agreement or insurance documents. And so that was our non-construction requirements. And now we're gonna move on to construction and public works. And just to give you a little bit of background, in July of 2016, our board approved us to become subject, subject to CUPCA. And CUPCA stands for the California Uniform Public Construction Cost Accounting Act. And what that did is it raised our formal bid threshold for construction projects from 15,000 up to 200,000. And it also created an informal bid process for projects between 60 and 200,000. And so this slide kind of has the same format as the non-construction, but I did just want to point out that with projects under $200,000, the board actually ratifies those agreements. And what that does is it, it creates more time for those smaller cost, cost construction projects so that we're not preventing any delays and we can stay within those timelines. And there are also exceptions to construction, even though it's not common that we utilize these, but I did just want to provide them here for reference. And there are also additional requirements for construction. So we have projects that are $60,000 or more. Those would require advertising requirements. Uh, $25,000 or more of those projects require bonds. We also have insurance requirements, license and registration requirements. And then we have requirements for, for having subcontractors and prevailing wage and other forms that we require as well. And this is everything that creates our process. So not only our board policies and administrative policies, but we're looking at other districts, best practice, case law, assembly bills, uh, Senate bills, and then all the different legal codes as well that we're required to abide by. All right, and that concludes my presentation. And if you have questions or need additional information, yeah, I'll help I have you with a, that. Uh, one question. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Some years ago, I was talking to a council member in one of the city council districts, and we were talking about bids. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you have a, any project over $5,000, you're supposed to get three bids for it. Is, mm -hmm. is that true? So it's not legally required, but at our district, if we have any requests that's 5,000 or more, we do require three bids. And that's for non-construction. And then anything that reaches our bid limit, which is currently 99,100, we would formally bid that. But you let the board know that you got three bids on each of these items before we are asked for approval? Well, we do our purchaser report. And so everything in that PO report is abiding by our requirements. There are times that we make exceptions to bidding or quotes. Um, sometimes they're a single source where they're not available Mm -hmm. or they have to be compatible with existing equipment or resources. And so in those cases, we don't always necessarily get quotes because it's just not possible to. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We do follow, all of this is laid out in the board policy and the administrative procedures. And so all of the things that Angie is describing tell the college and tell everyone here the processes that we need to follow. And so those are procedures and policies that are board approved. Questions? Yes. Yeah. If we are using, for example, a modular building, and I'm the athletic uh, area, I think yes. comes Marana to complex. Mind. Yes, mm -hmm. are we? Can we use a modular building where we piggybacked off of another 
uh, community college without going out to bid? Yes, because we are we do have piggyback agreements for modular buildings, and then there is an exception as well to that for construction for the installation piece. Or if the installation is forty nine percent or less of the overall cost, we don't necessarily have to bid that because it's considered incidental to the purchase. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just want to thank you for what you're doing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We appreciate what you guys are doing as well. So. And if you did have any questions or wanted additional information, please feel free to email me and I'm happy to share anything with you. So mm -hmm. right. thank you. Thank you. Uh, 11, item 11.3, 11 uh, presentation of outreach update. Good evening, members of the board, Dr. Zalette. My name is Kenya Johnson. I'm the Associate Dean of Outreach Services and Student Support here at Antelope Valley College. And this evening, I put together a little pre presentation for you all um, about our outreach department. Oh, I have the clicker, sorry. So this is a little, um, this is actually our mission for the Information Welcome Center and Outreach Department. And just so you know, the Outreach Department is a part of student services directly under student life with um, the leadership of Dr. Jill Zimmerman and Dr. Rivera. So um, we're really tuned into the idea that we need to provide accurate information to our students when we're at the Welcome Center. Um, we need to give them referrals. We, we need to make sure that they're having like a very pleasant experience because oftentimes they come to us when they have questions or when they're just arriving and onboarding to the college. So we have these um, four areas of responsibility that really fall directly under the outreach department. And these areas are outreach, welcome center, international students, and study abroad. So I'm gonna kind of go through these and give you a little more detail. Our welcome center, we're very student focused. Um, we try to be a one-stop destination for community members that walk into the college and they say, Hi, I'm here and I wanna get enrolled. I wanna do my application. Um, where do I start? So they really start typically with the Welcome Center. And um, we have about, I think seven or eight computers in the lobby where students um, can, or prospective students can get on and enroll and do things of that nature. Now, I wanted to share with you um, some of our data uh, to bring a little more meaning to what we're doing at the Welcome Center. So give me just a second here, there we go. Now in the 75 day period between June 13th and August 19th, um, we served 665 students in person. So we also um, are assisting the students over the phone. A lot of the phone calls that come into the college will be transferred to the Welcome Center and then we send the students, um, either we help them directly over the phone or we might be transferring them to another department. But in terms of students coming in in person, um, during that 75 day window, we had 665 students who came in. The majority of them wanted assistance with the ABC application. This was a time period right before school started up. Um, a lot of them wanted assistance with um, course enrollment, right? And sometimes it's just, where do I click? It's, it's not anything to do with counseling or giving in-depth in um, information, but it's just kind of the logistical how-to, um, general campus information, campus maps, things of that nature. So in the past uh, 30 days, this was really August 20th to September 30th, we served about 183 students specifically at the Welcome Center um, in person. So when we say that we're a one-stop shop um, at the Welcome Center, we really are. Moving along, um, I wanted to share these nine um, activities. This really is the bread and butter of our outreach department. Um, we are working with our K through 12 community partners. Um, we're going out to their campuses and giving presentations. We have a weekly new student success workshop that we hold on our campus. That's more for non-traditional students. We participate in College Information Night, which brings about 3,000 students, um, I would say 
prior to the pandemic. <laughs> there were about 3,000 students that were participate in that, and that's coordinated through our Antelope Valley High School District, um, which is one of our big, it is our biggest partner for um, K through 12 education, or sorry, for high school education. So um, salute to youth we participate in, festivals, and then our campus tours as well. So I always like to share data and I wanted to be sure that the board has this um, information as well. This data is specifically from 2020, 21. And so we served um, about 851 high school seniors participated in our orientation day. And that day we call it student success kickoff. Um, we have campus tours that we're running. We had about 464 students participate in our campus tours. Uh, we're doing high school counselor workshops. It's important to note that we are still in a recovery mode in terms of how many students are actually engaged and participating in our outreach activities. And these are prospective students. Um, also, it's, it's interesting to note that 80% of the students that attend Student Success Kickoff do end up enrolling and becoming Antelope Valley College students. Um, so with our presentations, um, this past year we did 42 financial aid presentations for about 2,000 students, and we had tabling events. Um, again, we talk about our college information night and salute to youth. And again, due to the pandemic, we are still recovering. One interesting fact is that we decided that our response to the pandemic would be that we saturate the market in terms of our outreach efforts. So we like really quadrupled the amount of presentations that we were doing, even though the numbers were so low that we still didn't quite reach the same amount of numbers um, of students that we actually engaged with. But we found that this was a good strategy because we were able to like get close to our pre-pandemic numbers. Um, and we're definitely recovering. We're seeing a lot more activity um, in this particular school year now. So this talks about our student success workshops and some of the festivals that we've attended. Oops, give me a minute here. So here's some photos, just some visuals for you all to enjoy. And you can see we've got some campus tours running. Um, and the students really tend to enjoy coming to our campus. Um, I, I can share a personal story. When I was in the second grade, I um, visited a major university about 30 miles from my home with my second grade class. And I looked up at the ceiling of the library and I said, wow, this is where I wanna go when I grow up because I was about eight years old. Um, and lo and behold, I actually ended up going to that institution and it's one of our UCs. So I'm, I'm very proud and I, I believe in the power that a campus tour has for young people. And I'm happy that we're continuing that tradition on our campus. So our institutional research department um, provided this information for me. And this talks about the trends, um, our race and ethnicity public school enrollments um, from 2001 until uh, 2021, and I'd like to encourage you to look at Antelope Valley Union High School District because they're our biggest feeder district. Um, and you can see that our students are becoming increasingly Latinx or Hispanic. Um, and the, certain uh, groups are going down a little bit, certain groups are maintaining or going up just slightly. But in the outreach department, we really try to be aware of who is in the pipeline so that we can tailor our messaging to those communities and help um, with equity gaps as well. So that being said, these are uh, a few of our current priorities. We wanna insist in improving college readiness and college planning uh, for all of the K through 12 students and for our community at large. We're looking at um, campaigns that are already taking place on campus. So 15 to finish, talking to students about, hey, enroll full-time. Here's the benefits of enrolling full-time. So that's what 15 units to finish in the two years talks about. And then we're looking at dual enrollment and collaborating with um, academic affairs for that. We're looking at our Promise program, and we're also interested in um, parent academies. Um, we also wanna address and improve equity gaps. 
So we do want to work with identified special populations, such as our undocumented students, our LGBTQIA, and historically underrepresented um, minoritized students as well. And we definitely want to assist more Pell Grant eligible students, because th that's where the needs are, right? Any questions? Um, you mentioned the festivals you go to, the Almond Blossom Festival, Poppy, and all that. You go to the small fairs and festivals. They have a lot of them. So we have, we've gone to um, the Tamale Festival and a couple of other festivals that are a little bit smaller. So it's, it's an ever evolving process to where as soon as we hear about it, uh, we kind of assess, is it how many participants are gonna be there? What are the opportunities? And then we make a decision to attend. Have you, have you gone on the boulevard and set up a table on there, you know, every Thursday night they have- Thursday night at the squares? At, at the boulevard, on the boulevard they have- uh, Lancaster Boulevard. Yeah. We have not gone to Lancaster Boulevard. So we'll we'll take that note and look into that. Yeah, you might wanna try that someday. Yeah. yeah. We're always hearing about new stuff that we can do. Thank you. I love the work that y'all doing and over there. I support y'all anything y'all need from me, just reach out. But I do have a question. Is there any way to track how many students are actually enrolling from your outreach program? So, so I think what you're asking me is students who have had at least one interaction with ABC outreach staff, and then kind of looking at, did they end up enrolling? It's a little easier to do if the students are in 12th grade. If the students are earlier than 12th grade, um, we don't have a specific like CRM mechanism to really track them. What we do though, we look at the high school yields at the high schools. And so we look at the percentage or the numbers of students graduating and then what percentage of those students come to our campus. So historically it's about 23 to 25% of the graduating class in the Antelope Valley will enroll at ABC. You're welcome. Anybody else? Hey, thank, thank you so you much. much. Okay, item 11.4, presentation of Kaiser Bio Academy, ABC summer collaboration. What's your emergency? Scudmore. I'm the Associate Dean of Health and Safety Sciences. I'm also the nursing director. Okay, so we have a motor vehicle accident. It's a female, 18 years old, and she's going to be Jane Doe because we don't know her name. She's going to be short of breath. She's got a temperature of 35.9 Celsius, diaphoretic. Her pain level is going to be high. She'll have a laceration of her spleen, a laceration to her face, some bruising of the lungs, fractured ribs. Kaiser's coming with RNs, they're coming with physicians, uh, pharmacists, someone who does medical billing, and uh, maybe more.
Good evening. I'm Dr. Casey Scudmore, as the video uh, told you, Associate Dean of Health and Safety Sciences and the Nursing Director. And the video uh, that you just watched was a highlight reel from our summer project where nursing faculty, uh, staff from Kaiser Permanente, and 15 high school students from Eastside Biomedical Academy uh, explored roles in healthcare using high fidelity simulation. Here on campus, we have a hospital suite set up. Some of you have seen it's three rooms and we have a whole family of uh, lifelike mannequins. They have heartbeats and lung sounds and pulses and all kinds of exciting uh, things. And we spent four days caring for a motor vehicle accident victim, as you can see, was played by the robotic mannequin. And we used equipment that they would see in the healthcare uh, industry. The Kaiser Permanente staff included nurses, pharmacists, radiology technicians, physical therapists, case managers, medical billers, physicians, managers, and ABC nursing faculty. And we guided the students through the patient scenario. This was also a nice way to introduce the students entering the last year of high school to ABC and all it has to offer in training, especially in healthcare. And I have some pictures. So the students use the iPad uh, to uh, manage the mannequin. And then we had a survey was overwhelmingly positive. We surveyed the staff, the students and the faculty. And many of the students expressed a desire to enter the healthcare field after participating in this event. And we had, um, they enjoyed working with the Kaiser Permanente staff. They gained insight into each healthcare role and they had a lot of fun performing CPR on the mannequins. As you can see, the, the three different uh, sections of the video where they were doing CPR, uh, they liked that. We had three press releases at the beginning, middle and the end to share what the collaboration was with the community and Kaiser Permanente and the Biomedical Academy have agreed to do this again next summer with a larger pool of participants. And then I just have some pictures for you this is the Kaiser um, nurses were helping triage the patient. We actually started in the EMT lab. They had to get the patient onto the gurney and then we had to stabilize them and then wheel them up quickly into the nursing lab that acted as our emergency room. And then you can see the students were collaborating together to figure out the plan of care for the patient. And then they were learning how to administer blood. And then this is uh, from our linked learning article. And then that's everyone that participated. Any questions? Yes. Uh, do they have, get a certificate when they complete the program? They didn't, but that's a very good idea. We can still do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is it only these side students that are eligible for the program? Currently, it was just this biomedical academy. It was kind of a pilot. And I would definitely like to talk to the other high schools and see if we can do this even during the year, not just during the summer, now that we know it works and we kind of have the formula down. I, I was, would just say that I know that Palmdale High School has a, a well-respected medical program. Perhaps this is something they would be interested in as well. Yes, I understand they have a simulator as well. So working with the staff would be wonderful. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you very much. Okay, moving on to item 12.1. There is uh, no report out of closed session action. Okay, uh, consent agenda. Uh, do we have a motion for 13.1 to 13.13? So moved. Second. 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 And I believe we have um, two public comment cards. Uh, Pam Ford. Thirteen point eight. Okay, no comment. Okay. Also, 13.10, Pam? Okay. All righty. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, Mr. President, I would like for 13.12, 13. Okay. Um, Let's go ahead and um, pull those two items. Which ones were that uh, again? 13.12, uh, 13.13. 13. 
13.13. Okay. We have a motion and a second on that. We do. And so we're actually. Mr. President. For questions before we vote. Right. Mr. Mr. President, yes. and, and I guess the question is um, for Board Member Reeves. Did you simply want to discuss those? Is that what you're choosing to do, uh, or did yes. you want to vote on them separately? Yeah. Well, when we can discuss them. That's why yeah. I asked for right. discussion. Okay. okay, go ahead. So and then you're, you're okay. Uh, okay. Um, on the 13.12, uh, Brad corrected agenda item. And um, how did I thought that these things are reviewed? How did this happen that? That we have to come back and do this again. Does anybody know what happened in this instance? Yeah, uh, Mr. Reeves, they are reviewed. They go to a go, they go through a, a queue where there are several reviewers. It's that um, a lot of these documents are coming across, and all of these projects. Uh, what happened in this case was one document that was associated with this project got mixed up with another document. And so um, we realized it after the fact, and um, it's just, there's a lot of volume coming across and um, they got mixed up. They're all, they're all projects and documents that are coming forward, but it got attached to the wrong way. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, on 13.13, 13, uh, it has to deal with letting people use the facilities uh, on campus and, um, it talks about the validity of a group wanting to use the space. Who's going to uh, determine the validity of a group wanting to use the facilities on campus? And do these people have an option to appeal to the board if they don't like the decision? So if you look farther down in the board policy, it identifies the final paragraph identifies the purposes for which these, uh, these facilities can be used. And so, um, there, this is this is the designation, and it's up to the board to approve this designation or or don't. Uh, there's nothing in there about appealing uh, decision of whomever makes the decision to allow these people. So, Mr. Reeves, those um, the facilities use requests. This is a policy that this. Uh, that uh, defines that process. So this is the board policy. Then we have a, a administrative procedure and the process is outlined in more detail on facilities. But the answer to your question is it comes to the facilities ta staff, facilities management. Right. They'll get the request and they're not looking to deny a facilities use request. But if somebody has an issue, they can always, they can always come here and appeal, right? Okay, thank you. Okay, any further questions? Hearing none, advice? Approved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, passes unanimously. Action items 14.1 rescind approval of the lease agreement between Noah's Ark Foundation and El Valley Community College District for four greenhouses for agricultural research. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, any discussion? Hearing none, advice? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Okay, item 14.2, approval of resolution number 22-23-5, authorizing the issuance of Allen Valley Community College District, Los Angeles and Kern County election of 2016 general obligation bonds, series C and actions related thereto. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Uh, yes, Mr. President. I'm making a, a, a counter motion that this be pulled and discussed at- uh, Well, we already have a motion okay, well, on the floor. Okay. So we have to vote on okay, that. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and discuss it. Okay. Discuss it. Uh, here are the papers, the big stack of papers that have to do with what we're gonna vote on. It's uh, very complicated legal stuff. There are gaps in the papers. They're, they're not filled out. Uh, the pages, uh, I can give you the pages, uh, Mr. Vice President, where they're not filled out. We're asked to, to appeal.
include contracts and things that have blanks for 66, what, $60 million? And you, you can't function as an institution that way. You can't ask the board to approve something with blanks in it. Uh, is it too much to ask that we have information in here that we know what these people are gonna do? Or are we just giving the authority to the college to approve all these bonds, to sell all these bonds, and then we'll come back later and they'll, these other organizations will fill in the gaps. Now, that's not how you run a government agency. And I'd like you to come up here and, and answer, answer a few questions. And I asked you to have your forms here so you can uh, talk about specific instances. Okay. Um, is that okay? Um, so, if this is an extensive discussion, then we can give you the information offline rather than engage in a specific back and forth. Uh, Vice President Brar is is submitting documents based on pre-approved uh, actions by the board, and so the documents presented here are continuances of pre-approval for the bond, and. I don't pre-approving the bond. Well, what I mean by pre-approval is the community voted to approve. No, well, you're asking the board to approve it. And the board has an obligation to, com to the community that if we are uh, approving legal documents that they be filled out. Is that asking too much? No, it's not asking too much. If for if there is any information there that is blank, there is a reason it is blank. We have our financial advisor here, or we have our underwriter here, Frank Vega. He can also answer questions, and they're the ones that help us because it is a very complicated process, and it's not a process that we're experts in by any means. So we rely on the advice and the guidance of our uh, partners here, which there are several partners because that's not something that we engage in regularly. Now. All of those data elements, I can tell you the fiscal team, facilities team, there's a lot of teams that work very hard to gather that information and gather it timely. If there's something that's not complete, we'll look at it and make sure you have the information you need to vote as you need to. Um, but you know, give us an opportunity to answer that question. But I also have you know, our underwriter here to, that'll help support um, and answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Yeah, uh, yeah, I have a specific document. I'm talking about the purchase contract uh, and uh, for it, and there are blanks all over the place on the purchase agreement. Uh, yeah. You want us to, like the first page is uh, blanks and, and okay. then it's second okay. page the blanks and all through this document are blanks and you want us to approve it? and uh, give you a blank check to do what you want, then you can say to the board, approve it. Uh, good evening, uh, Board yeah. Member Reeves, uh, President of Buffalo, members of the community, uh, President Zellett, uh, nice to see you again. So what you're approving tonight, what you're being asked to approve tonight are a set of form documents that are deliberately blank because they're all contingent upon the successful bond sale us going into the marketplace, locking in interest rates. So this is um, not just standard, this is the requirement statewide, whether it's Antelope Valley College, Palmdale School District, Los Angeles uh, Community College District, you're approving the form of the, of the document. And the reason why they're blank, as I just mentioned, is we have yet to go to market. We can't go to market the bonds, sell the bonds, and deliver your project funds until the board approves the authorization for us to do so. These are bond, These are documents, excuse me, that are drafted by your legal counsel, uh, the same legal counsel that you've used for 20 plus years. This is the exact same process that we did. We did for the Series C bond issue under Measure AB, the Series A bond uh, measure, uh, bond series for Measure AB, and then the prior uh, bond measure in 2004. So while I know it may seem a bit uh, confusing that all these blanks are in these documents, that again is deliberate because they all get populated once the bond sale is completed. What you're looking at these blanks, dollar amounts, the interest rate, the amount of bond proceeds that go to the college, that's all dependent upon the final interest rate that we lock in on the day of sale. That day of sale won't occur if you were to approve it tonight, probably won't occur for another three weeks. Okay. 
I, I want a straight answer. Yes. I've gone all the way up to my friend who is the Los Angeles County Assessor for the whole county, and I can't even get a straight answer from him. Okay. If we approve the sale of these bonds, are the property taxes going to go up for the people that have to pay the interest on the bonds? The property taxes will all but certainly go up in the upcoming fiscal year, not the one that you're in, fiscal 22, 23. Right now, the community is paying about a $21 tax. The legal limit, as we, if you recall from our last meeting, was $25 okay. per 100,000 assessed valuation. Okay. The expectation to deliver the project funds is to get the tax back to a, a, a number closer to $25. So I think on average, we'd be looking at for the first year, about a $3 increase per household uh, by the approval of the bond this, this evening. But every bond that you sell is gonna have a 20 or 30 year life. Um, the, right now, the expectation is 25 years. 25 years, let's say you sell one tomorrow. So 25 years from now, we have to give the principal back to the bond. Is that correct? That is correct. The bonds are paid over a 25-year period. That's what levels out, normalizes the so tax. We have all these bonds, like half a billion dollars out right now. Half a billion dollars. 489? It's, it's, a, little, it's a little less than that, but, but it's okay. approximately. So they, they become due at different increments that we have to give the people the money back, right? That is correct. Each year, okay. the county assessor sets the tax. How are we going to pay people back a half a billion dollars? So the, the if you're asking how the bonds are repaid, it's, it's as you just alluded to, and I apologize, it's not the assessor, it's the treasurer tax collector. The treasurer tax collector is going to set the tax needed to pay back the bonds, whether it's the, from the 2004 measure or from measure AB. What, what the college and what the community voted on in 2016 for measure AB was a maximum tax not to exceed $25. This year it's down to about $21 and I think 30, actually it's 22 cents. So $21 and 22 cents. So it's fallen about $3 and 78 cents. To get more project funds to the college to complete the projects that were highlighted at the last board meeting, what would be required is to raise the tax from that $21 range up to 25, which is what the community voted on. And then each year as these bonds come due, as you, as you mentioned, sir, that's what then gets paid back to the bondholders over a 25 year period. The community has authorized a $25 tax. We cannot exceed that. And over time, that's what that's how the monies get paid back to the bondholders. The money on our property tax goes to pay the interest on the bond. And, and principal too, sir. Yeah, it doesn't pay the principal. No, 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 it does. It does, it, does, it, it pays so you both. You still have the principal. And if you can't pay the principal, what do you do? You refinance it, don't you? So the, as the college has, has pursued and has delivered taxpayer savings over the last 10 years, if rates are low, so as an example for, for, the, for the board in general, if we were to sell the bonds today, we're expecting an interest rate of approximately 5%. Over the next between, let's say we sold the bonds tomorrow, over the next 10 years, if rates were to fall again, say 3%, 2%, 4%, whatever it may be, the college has the opportunity to refinance to deliver taxpayer savings. As an example, last summer, actually it was uh, late summer, early fall, the college did exactly that. We sold a bond refinancing. It was approximately 60 million of bonds that we sold and we lowered taxes by almost, I think $10 million. No project funds came to the college. It was simply a, a financing that lowered taxes. That's another reason why the tax this year is $21 and 22 cents and not $25. Over time, we've had opportunities to refinance the bonds and lower the debt payments for the community. Have you ever heard of a situation where the bonds are refinanced and the entity gets cash during the refinance and they invest the cash and they use the interest from the cash they got from the refinance to pay the interest on the bonds. You ever hear of that situation? Oh, sir, that, that's a great point. And, and state law now prohibits any uh, public agency. In this case, we'll just focus on community colleges. Every time the college does a bond refinancing, every single penny must go back to the taxpayer. Unfortunately, in the past, what would happen is a college could do a refinancing and generate additional funds for, for projects. That practice has been deemed illegal by the state attorney general. So now, since 2008, 
every bond financing, refinancing in the state of California, every single penny has to go back to the taxpayers. So, so that's a great point that you bring up, but for unfortunately or fortunately, for general obligation bonds in the state of California, specific to community colleges, you cannot keep any of the proceeds. It all goes to the treasurer tax collector and they lower property taxes based off of the refinancing of the bonds. So it's a long-winded way of saying not one penny of a bond refinancing ever comes back to Antelope Valley College. You give it all back to the taxpayers. Which we have done in the past. Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Reeves, if we can move along with this, we passed the bonds. We passed two bonds overwhelmingly. This is, the horse has been out of the barn for quite a while. And we seem to be arguing the point of the taxpayers approved this overwhelmingly. Uh, what year, uh, Mr. President? 2016. 2016? Yes, measure AB was approved. So during the last uh, census, uh, city of Lancaster lost population. So some of those people may have gone out of town or died. Mr. Reeves, that's an irrelevant point. It is because the voters have voted. We're not up here to relitigate people's vote. Now, if you have questions about the document, I believe those are appropriate. You have a right to ask these questions. And I'm glad that you found out what the blanks were for. But I don't think taking the time to go over what the voters did is our responsibility. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, on one of the pages uh, on this uh, Al Valley College District Purchase Contract, uh, A1, it's completely blank. There's nothing on there about interest rate or anything. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I mean, we have no idea what we're doing. Um, so again, uh, and I right. apologize. If, we don't know what we're doing. I, I don't think that's a fair representation. What I would say, sir, is we are going to know the final rates when we enter the market. Um, we're not flying blind. Um, we have a schedule, a schedule that we presented to the senior administration. The idea is, and the way the college is, is going to proceed, should you vote yes, should the board vote yes, we only sell the bonds when the interest rates are favorable that day. We don't sell the bonds when rates are going up 0.10 or 0.25% in a given day. And that's why we can't populate those numbers. If we were to give you an estimate today, they could be higher than what we've told you. They could be lower than what we've told you. That's why those blanks are there. Or I'm sorry, that's why. That's why there are blanks because we haven't locked in the final rates, but we have a schedule. This is what we did for series B. This is what we did for series A. This is what professionals like myself and my company do statewide with community colleges. We get approval from the board. It takes about three weeks once the county, because the next step is the county has to approve this. Should you vote yes tonight, the county board of supervisors has to approve this financing. Then with their approval, we then go into the marketplace. Once that happens, we can populate the numbers and state law requires us to come back after the bond sale and give you the final numbers and you'll have all those, all those blanks populated. Okay, now uh, the last presentation, the speaker said that 90% of the bonds were sold to investors and 10% to the general public. Is that correct? Is that a good ratio? It really depends on, on market rates at the time, but 90 to 95% going to large institutional investors is a fair, is a fair assessment. Yes, sir. So uh, the rich and the powerful make tax-free money. Well, uh, sometimes it's insurance companies. So insurance companies that pay premiums and policies over a 25-year period, they like a 25-year Antelope Valley College bond because they line up their liabilities with the monies that'll be coming in from property taxes. A lot of times pension funds buy, buy municipal bonds, local governments buy municipal bonds. In fact, the Los Angeles County uh, Department of Water and Power is a big purchaser of bonds because they like the high yields and they're safe, they're paid by property taxes. So it's not, um, it's not hedge funds. It's not wealthy individuals, it's bond funds that manage monies for everyday citizens, that manage monies for teachers' unions, things like that. Uh, uh, okay. well, thank you very much, sir. Sure, of course. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Advice. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Is that unanimous? No, opposed. Okay, opposed. 
passes 401. Okay, we've pulled item 14. Point, well, we've got 14.3. Approval of academic policies and procedures, APMP, committee recommendations of course listing. Do we have a motion? So move. Second. Okay, any discussion? Hearing none advice. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is that a unanimous? Okay, unanimous. Item 14.4 has been approved, moving along to 14.5. Approval of contract between Lamar and Animal Valley Community College with 2022-23 CTE marketing campaign. We have a motion. So moved. Second. Second, any discussion? Hearing none advice? Approved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, passes unanimously. Item 14.6, approval to professional service agreement with the Stion Group, LLC for student housing application. Is there a motion? So move. So second. Second. Any discussion? Uh, yes, Mr. President. Um, on 14.6, it says that uh, this is the uh, professional services agreement. And it says there is a attachment number one for fees. And I, I printed out the agreement, but uh, I couldn't find an attachment for the fees. What are the fees, Mr. Vice President? It's included in the scope of work. So, so it's page eight. The beginning of scope of work starts on page eight. The thing. Right. Total cost of services not to exceed 120,000 with uh, 5,000 in reimbursements. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, any other discussion? Hearing none, advice? Approved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. 14.6. Uh, oh, 14.7. Approval of master service agreement with Marco A. Blanco, DBA. S3. Oh, we're going to do all four of these together. These are all uh, similar. So 14.7, 14.8, 14.9, 14.10 all involves catering and food services. Can we have a motion to approve those four? So move. Okay. Any discussion? Yes. President, we spent $250 million putting up buildings, and we don't have a cafeteria on this campus. That's a disgrace. And I call on the administration to do something about that. If they have to farm out something, we need a cafeteria on this campus. We do not need a whole slew of different food trucks in the middle of campus feeding the students at inflated prices. Cafeteria was used as a social place for the faculty and the students, in addition to being a reasonably priced place to eat. And uh, I can't see how we're benefiting from having food trucks all over our campus when we're spending that kind of money on buildings. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, what are your what do, what are your plans to open up our cafeteria? Do you have a plan in place or? So the the cafeteria plans are something we could discuss in detail later. If they're in development, we are working on that. This these four items here are to allow uh, further extension of utilization of these food trucks. So the further to the previous comment, our our food trucks have been working with the college to put together low cost meals that are more available to students in their in their budget as well as employees because we've heard the comments. From um, from everyone who's been you know using those services, we recognize it's not a long term solution, and we're working on it. Okay, we have a motion or a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none. Advice. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Nay. Nay. Okay. No one need advice. And pull up. 14.11, approval of professional service agreement with High Desert Auction to handle obsolete equipment auction. Is there a motion? So move. Second. 
there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, advice? Approved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 14.12. Approval to dispose of surplus obsolete supplies and equipment. Do we have a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, advice? Approved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Item 14.13. Approval of field service agreement with JP Moss Construction, Inc., DBA Paul Davis, restoration of Santa Clarita for child development center abatement. Is there a motion? So Second. moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Hearing none, advice? Approved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Item 14.14, approval of service agreement with Rawlings Mechanical Corporation repair the irrigation main line located on Technology Drive. Do we have a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, advice? Approved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 14.15, approval of master services uh, agreement with um, Course Maven Inc and DBA dualenroll.com from October 11th, 2022 to September 30th, 2023. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, advice? Approved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 14.16, approval to amend expiring one-year services contract with IP quality score LLC through August 9th. 2026. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Hearing none, advice? Approved. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 14.17 approval of project amendment agreement, PAA, with American Engineering Laboratories, Inc., for laboratory of record services for the T Mobile Dish Tower. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, any discussion? Hearing none, advice? Approved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Okay, item 14.18, approval to utilize the foundation of California Community Colleges cooperative agreement with KYI Services LLC for the purchase of facilities fixtures. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, advice? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. 14.19, approval to utilize the Omnia Partners Public Sector, formerly U.S. Communities Cooperative Agreement with Home Depot USA, Inc. to purchase maintenance, repair, operating supplies, industrial supplies, and related products and services. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, advice? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Passes. 14.20, approval to utilize the Omnia Partners Public Sector, formerly U.S. Agreement, Communities Agreement with Home Depot to purchase paint and paint supplies. Is there a motion? So moved. Okay. Any discussion? Oh, is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Hearing none, advice? Approved. All in favor? Hi. Item 14.21, approval to utilize Source Wells Cooperative Agreement with Lion First Responder PPE Incorporated for firefighting personnel protective equipment purchases. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, advice? Approved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 14.22, um, approval to purchase emergency blue phone towers, security camera equipment, and software from Black Box Network Services and redevelopment funds, with redevelopment funds. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. And Pam, did you want to speak to this?
Good evening. Um, I am Pamela Ford, president of the Classified Union. And I just had a question. This is, uh, I think, the second time that a uh, something to do with security security cameras has been brought forward to the board. And I have asked for an up updated uh, information on this because we have a signed MOU that states anytime cameras are going to be installed, that the unions have the right to this information. I know for certain the classified union. And so I would like to get a map of the locations and where the new cameras are. And, and I hope I don't have to come back and ask again. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, we're working on that marking up the maps. Uh, the cameras on these are specifically associated with the top of the blue phones for safety in the parking lots and other areas and not in workspaces or in buildings. Okay. Which I believe the MOU directly addresses. Okay, so it's, it's actually in the parking lot. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any other questions? Uh, advice? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, item 14.23, uh, approval of project amendment agreement, PAA, with Atlas Technical Consultants, LLC for Laboratory of Record Services for the AT&T dish tower upgrade. Is there a motion? Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none advice. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 14.25, approval to purchase Dell computer equipment for new student services building with measure AV funds. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Oh. Um, I have it as 26. Okay, so we're okay. No, we uh, have to do 1424. You skipped it. Oh, did I skip it? Yes. I'm trying. <laughs> okay. 14.24, let's go back. Approval uh, of project amendment agreement, PAA, with vital inspection services for inspector record services for T for the T-Mobile dish tower upgrade and the AT&T cell tower upgrade. Do we have a motion? Second. Okay. All right, any discussion? Hearing none advice? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, 14.25 now. Approval to purchase the Dell equipment for new student services building with measure AV funds. Is there a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Okay, any discussion? Yes, uh, yes, Mr. President. Now, here we go again. Um, this equipment is going to be purchased with measure AV and COVID funds. Is that correct? Mr. Reeves, this is computer equipment for the new student services building. So this is a part of the construction program. It's going to have new IT equipment. Um, specifically for that building, so it is purely paid out of Measure AV funds. But you're using the COVID funds? No, yeah. Measure AV funds. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, advice? Absolutely. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Okay, items 14.26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39 are all related to measure AV funds. Okay, we have a motion on so, all of those. So moved. Okay, there's a second. second. Okay, any uh, discussion? Yes, Mr. President. Uh, all these items have to do with measure AV funds. So when we take all the money away from the contingency fund, we're not going to have any measure AV funds, and in the future, they should come out of the general budget, right? 
So these, there's no discussion about taking any money from any contingency funds. These are all funded out of Measure AZ through existing money that pre bonds that have already been sold. So uh, we, we won't have uh, to take any money out of the contingency fund for the bond. Uh, Which contingency fund are you speaking 10%, about? 10% contingency fund for the uh, AZ bond. Uh, so are you referring to the set aside? Yeah. Uh -huh. That is not under discussion right now. That's not a part of this conversation. No. The, okay. Yeah, the endowment, no, that is not discussed. Okay. You answered. Okay. All right. We, we have a motion and a second. Uh, advice? Approved. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Passes unanimously. Was that a yes on your part, Mr. Reeves? I'm, was that a yes? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Information items, uh, 15.1, any points? Uh, oh, which you guys? Okay. Uh, reports and announcements. Uh, no one's here from the Academic Senate, right? Okay. 16.2 uh, is that? Apple Valley College Federation of Teachers, Dr. Jason Bowen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board, uh, President Zillette. On December 9th, 2019, the board voted unanimously to approve a calendar change. Uh, this particular calendar change uh, affected scheduling throughout the year and most notably eliminated intercession. Uh, it was my opinion then, it was the Federation's position then that uh, that unilateral calendar change was illegal. I still feel the same way today. The Federation still has that same stance today that uh, this particular calendar change was illegal. Now, I, I get passionate about some things, some things I'm not so passionate about, but I get especially passionate about things where it appears to me that the language is exceptionally clear regarding what should occur and what should not occur. Uh, in this case, uh, the collective bargaining agreement, faculty collective bargaining agreement, and uh, board policy 4010 are very explicit about what's required to bring about a calendar change such as the one that was approved December 9th, uh, 2019. Now, the good news is an administrative law judge ruled recently, so this is September 13, 2022, uh, Valerie Racho, she ruled, I'll just read the proposed order Upon the foregoing findings of fact and conclusions of law and the entire record in the case, it is found that Antelope Valley Community College District, District violated the Educational Employment Relations Act, Government Code Section 3540 at SEC by unilaterally changing its academic calendar to eliminate its intercession and, ex and expand its summer session from eight to 12 weeks and by dealing directly with faculty bargaining unit employees regarding the calendar changes thus bypassing their exclusive representatives, the Antelope Valley College Federation of Teachers Faculty Union. All other claims were dismissed. This is a vindication of sorts, not a gloating, a vindication in that for me personally, I can, I, I can trust my interpretation. So I read the collective bargaining agreement. It seems pretty clear what it's stating. I read state law. It's not always so clear what that's stating. I read board policy. It seems pretty clear what that's stating. And when administrators are making these sorts of claims over a period of months, for example, one administrator stated, as stated on numerous occasions in the past, the calendar is not subject to traditional negotiation. Uh, on another occasion, it was stated in the context of meeting with uh, the faculty union uh, that any such meetings regarding a, an MOU do not constitute traditional negotiations. Yet on another occasion, on, Jan on January 7, 2020, an administrator repeated that
that the district's position is that negotiations are not required for a calendar change. Now, again, the administrative law judge ruled that in fact, how I interpret the collective bargaining agreement is accurate. How I interpret board policy 4010 is accurate. How others read these documents and interpret them is accurate. And she affirmed that by simply making the statement that does not make it true. And I think we live in an environment all over the world. We, there's this environment where men and women in positions of leadership simply take advantage of the fact that because they have the bully pulpit, they can make the statement and it's true. Despite the fact that we have clear rights, despite the fact that we have a constitution, despite the fact that we have state law and statutes that we all must abide by. And I think that what's important for us or incumbent upon us as educators, as students, as life learners, is that we abide by the rules, we treat everyone fairly according to the rules, because we're gonna send our students out and expect them to treat others the same and abide by the rules that we feel that we all should live according to. So when we learn that the district decided to appeal the ruling, uh, it was exceptionally disappointing. And the concern is, are we going to continue to see the same things that we've seen over the past several years or can we move to a point where if we're wrong, we're wrong. Even if legally we're afforded latitude, they're still right and wrong. I may have legal rights to say not pay child support, but there's, a, there's a, a, an obligation to my daughter, to others, to just simply do what's right. So uh, what I hope going forward is that we can simply do what's right. Okay, I'm sorry, um, Mr. Bowen uh, made some representations regarding an appeal. I, it's the second time I think I've heard that information and I've actually discussed that with him. I'm not sure where that information is coming from, but I would hope that the Federation would um, not just in general um, make comments um, to the board at the dais um, without talking. That, that would be perfect. And in, in addition, um, just for the board's information, um, there was a proposed decision. It is not a final decision. The PERP has a process. Um, um, as you know, we've gone through it um, in, an, in another matter and it takes a little while for um, there to be a final decision um, in that process. Previously, um, the PERP reversed, which is how we ended up in a, um, an eight year litigation. So um, just want the board to be advised that uh, Mr. Bowen is right. It's a proposed decision. It's not a final decision at this point. Okay. Thank you. Any questions up here? No? Okay. Um, moving along. Uh, Alamo Valley uh, College Federation of Classified Employees, Pamela Ford. Good evening again. Um, the district, I'm happy to say, after eight and a half years with this PERB charge, the district and the Federation have um, come to an agreement on at least verifying the employees affected by PERB, except for about three or four individuals. We are hopeful that we can reach resolution with the compensation piece, compensating employees in full and not dinking around with how much employees should be receiving, because those are wages that were earned. After a brief interruption, classified in the district are returning to the bargaining table. Um, we have a joint letter should be going out to the classified because classified want updates. They wanna know what's going on. And so hopefully this letter will go out soon. Right now it's in the hands of the district team. I um, also wanna say that I am happy that classified come forward and speak about their concerns. And I know I, I watch other board meetings and a lot of boards are pleased to hear from other employees besides just the union president because it shows the level of concern. Um, 
but I just want to clarify some things for the district and for the classified. So if the bell starts dinging, can I keep talking? Not long, no. <laughs> um, we're in the process of negotiating many proposals. Um, most significant salaries and benefits. There is a lot of upset um, on the part of classified classified because specifics of that package have not been given out yet. In light of the fact that the package uh, has been brought forward, there have been robust discussions at the table, but respectful, surrounding salaries and benefits. And um, we are hoping that a fair package will, become, will be forthcoming. Being president of the classified exclusive bargaining unit, for all classified employees, I feel strongly that since we have a new administration who is very much concerned about bringing community and camaraderie back to the campus, I'm working within that framework to continue working with the district positively instead of the previous acrimonious relationship that we've had. Though positive, there is a lot of work that goes into the bargaining process. There's a lot of research, there's a lot of writing, there's a lot of back and forth. And through this work, we're hoping to bring positive news to the classified. I'm not interested in reverting back to an acrimonious environment. I'm hoping fervently that this will bring good outcomes for classified. And I think everyone is aware that I don't shrink back from a fight. I never have and I never will. But I am for my, I always fight for my members, but right now we're working through this process and the letter being sent out, I hope will be beneficial to classified. It's something that we're gonna be discussing tomorrow in negotiations. I am not naive and I know that things can go south, but I'm working toward the best outcome for everybody. So I just feel that it's important for the board and for the classified to know that we're not holding anything back. We're not keeping anything quiet. We just wanna make sure that when we send out specific information, that it's accurate information and that we don't want to create a whole lot of hostility and anger. We don't want to say, well, we submitted this, but the district only gave us that. There's plenty of time for that if we feel we're not being treated fairly. But right now, let's see what this new administration is going to do. So thank you. Thank you, Carol. OK. Yes. <laughs> OK. OK, well, can you left? Here she comes, Kenya. Oh, no report. Okay, thank you. Uh, Associated Student Organization, Diana Ferrazzoli. She's not here? Okay. And uh, Ms. Knippel is not here. And then Dr. Zalat. Good evening, trustees and colleagues. In honor of Indigenous Peoples Day, I would like to open tonight's comments with the land acknowledgement that anthropology professor Darcy Rewald uses on her syllabi and in her classes. In keeping with Indigenous protocol, we would like to acknowledge that Antelope Valley College District is situated upon the traditional lands of the Chumash, Kawaisu, Kitanimuk, Zorano, Tataviam, Vanyumi, and to many diverse Indigenous peoples who call this region home. We also pay respect to elders, both past and present, and the enduring presence of indigenous peoples on this land. We recognize that these tribes are still here, and we are committed to lifting up their stories, culture, and community. As an institution of higher education, it is our privilege to share in the celebration of the many indigenous cultures that comprise our community. We have dedicated this entire month to Hispanic Heritage Month, and many thanks go to our colleagues in student services who have organized activities to celebrate and learn. The faculty in the visual and performing arts division also contributed through art exhibits in the gallery. We celebrate, we learn, and we become better for appreciating the rich contributions from those who have come before us and whose traditions live on today. Today is also World Mental Health Day. 
One could argue that the week after midterms is the perfect time for such a day of awareness. And all across this campus, we're reaching out to support students and each other. The campus, again, mourns the loss of another colleague. Mr. Maximo Dueño, who began teaching computer applications in 2017, passed away. All around him are feeling his loss, his students, his colleagues, and his family and friends. Mental health during times of grief is essential and we are here to support. An email went out to the campus today offering the connection to our employee assistance program and we encourage everyone who would like to avail themselves of those services to do so. Before I close, I want to recognize a couple of things. Tonight is the last meeting that Rick Shaw will be manning the technology desk. He is retiring and we want to thank Rick for his many years of dedicated service to Antelope Valley College and to making the board look good on the big screen. And thank you, Rick, for all that you've done. We're gonna miss you and we're gonna miss the ice cream gatherings on super hot summer days. Blessings and peace in your retirement. One last thing I wanna mention, Antelope Valley College is in the middle of the You Got Caught Doing Something Good campaign. All those who are nominated will be celebrated at the October 29th homecoming game and the board will be receiving special invitations. We'll be having a celebration for that. Um, at that time, we will also have the dedication ceremony of the Frank O'Dell press box. All are invited to attend. We wanna have a big celebration for our homecoming, acknowledge all the people who get caught doing great deeds every day who often go unnoticed. As we begin week nine, we are more committed than ever to serve students and be kind. Thank you. Thank you. Board member comments, we'll start with our student trustee. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, just wanna start off with our the Civic Voters and Engagement Committee that I've been working on, that I've been a part of with a couple of faculty members. We are planning our next event for October 25th here on campus to be decided on the room, but at 6 p.m. we wanna have a Board of Trustees forum, just like we did with Mark Garcia and Christy Smith. But this time we're gonna have, we want them all in the same room. Not a debate, just a forum. Also, those events did go well with Christy Smith. I don't know if any of y'all attended, but they went extremely well with both Christy and uh, Mr. Mike Garcia, Senator Mike Garcia. And yeah, I'm just glad to be here. I uh, got faith in our board up here. I got faith in our school. And I feel that we are going in the right direction. And that's all I got. Thank you. Mr. Adams. Gonna miss you, Rick. And uh, good luck and have a happy retirement. And I know there's a novel in you somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Reeves. Uh, no comment. Rick, live long and prosper. Oh, I don't have too much this evening, but I, I do want to wish Rick the very best in your retirement and uh, want to say thank you because I don't know how many times you have found the, the uh, board agenda for me when I couldn't find it numerous times. I know that for a fact. So um, wish you weren't going, but if it must be, I wish you the very, the very, very best in the next chapter of your life. Thank you for your service. I'm going to part some Jack Cephas wisdom on you for your retirement. When Jack was asked about retirement, how he liked it. He says, I get up every morning and try to find something to entertain me. That's the key. Okay. Um, one other item. I was talking to um, a woman the other day. Her daughter is attending school here. She's gone through all the prerequisites for nursing and she was on the campus. She went here as a student and she was blown away. She said, this is incredible what is going on out here on this campus. So she was amazed. So with that, we will uh, adjourn. There will be no uh, closed session necessary. And we will uh, adjourn to the next meeting, which is November 14th. We're done. <laughs>